East Germany, 1961, a communist state cut off from modern Europe, now stuck in a post-World War II purgatory. Ernst Degner was known throughout the country as one of its shining stars, a celebrated motorcycle racer who had brought a small measure of glory to his troubled countrymen and women. But on this September day, Degner wasn't on the racetrack. Instead, he was hiding his young wife and their children in the trunk of a friend's car. He hoped to turn his back on his country and escape to the West. Why was Degner leaving East Germany at the height of his fame? How was the Japanese company Suzuki embroiled in his defection? And what secrets did Degner have stuffed in a briefcase that he was carrying with him on that autumn day in communist Germany? Today on Past Gas, the story of the motorcycle racer turned spy Ernst Degner, as well as that of a Nazi engineer named Walter Cotton. From World War II to the glamour and devastation of 1950s Grand Prix racing, Degner and Walter's destinies were shaped by larger-than-life forces, but through a series of choices of their own making. They shaped their futures and, in the process, altered the history of motorcycle racing forever. Thank you to our sponsor this week, a longtime sponsor of Past Gas. I'm talking Valvoline Oil. Valvoline was America's first motor oil brand, making them the original motor oil. All Valvoline oils exceed industry standards to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road, including mine. I've got Valvoline in my car right now, and I've got Valvoline in a low car right now, too. Valvoline's got a new oil for you guys. They got their new extended protection full synthetic motor oil. It's their best oil ever. Valvoline Extended Protection Full Synthetic, their newest formula, offers ultimate protection designed to extend the life of your engine. It's 10 times stronger against oil breakdown, helps your engine grow old without acting old. Meaning, as the oil ages, it gets thicker and thicker due to thermal degradation. This oil, though, protects against that 10 times better than industry standards. I put this stuff in my engine before I went to the autocross a few weeks ago. I'm really happy with it. You gotta do everything you can to help extend the life of your car. So, when you change your oil, make sure it's Valvoline Motor Oil. Thank you very much, Valvoline. Dude, the modulation on your voice in that last sentence, mm-hmm. chef's yeah. kiss. Mm-hmm. Chef's kiss. Dude, thank you, man. Mm-hmm. Podcaster's kiss, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Podcaster's kiss. Someone's been uh, taking notes from the strip club DJ. <laughs> Coming to the stage now, it's Ernst Degner. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's the can't, most Isley Cantina song. <laughs> <laughs> the best strip club song in the world. I was trying to do a polka. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did hear the... Starts doing the chicken dance. Uh-huh. That's great. That's wonderful. <laughs> Friday, boys. It is it's Friday. Friday. It's Friday. Friday. Let the hogs loose. It has been a very heavy week this week in the donut garage. I cut a hole in the bottom of a car. A little whoopsie. A little oopsie. Nolan and I have been sucking in fumes and metal flakes. I got a ton of little tiny splitters in me. Yeah, I can feel it. I might have COVID. Yeah, Joe might have COVID. We had a big old COVID scare. By scare, I mean a lot of people got COVID. (laughs) I took a test last night. I don't have it. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Welcome to the show, everyone. Welcome to Past Gas. If this is your first time listening, thank you. Welcome. This is yeah. Uh, where have you been this whole time? Where you listen to uh, Karen Kilgariff or something? Yeah, I'm glad that they're here. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth, as it were. Nice. Yeah, gift horses are tricky because sometimes you want to return a, the horse. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, maybe you already have one. I already have a car in my garage spot. Where am I going to put you? I don't have the money for hay. Living room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the show, everyone. Uh, um, the voices you're hearing, well, the first one is mine. My name is Nolan Sykes. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and that laugh you just heard, that's Joe Weber over there. Slime off a of slug's back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and finally, we got James Pumphrey. It's the macaroni with the cheese. 
<laughs> That's really good. I can tell you went really loud because our Zoom call limits your volume. Yeah. And it, it just went that. quiet <laughs> halfway yeah, through. It like goes quiet. It cuts out. And I'm like, okay, it must have gone to like a high register on that one. Yeah, um, I went falsetto. Ooh, I can't wait to listen I to wish this back. It, yeah, I wish it didn't cut out because I sounded just like Frank Ocean. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, I'm definitely listen, listening back to this one for sure. <laughs> My boy pretty like a girl. He got five stories to tell. Go both plays like Chanel. Go both. Guys, I wasn't playing Spotify. That was me. Whoa. Oh, wait. Yeah. I was going to say, we're going to get flagged and we have to play, pay EMI or whatever. No, I met a genie. <laughs> no way. Was it yeah. Sinbad? And <laughs> yeah. No and way. one of my wishes, he looked like him, but he was like, I'm not him. <laughs> but one of my wishes was I want to sing just like Frank, Frank Ocean. That's a really good wish. That'd be it. That's a hell of a wish. When I was in high school, I really wished that my singing voice sounded like Lane Got Staley. From no, Lane Staley from Alice in Chains. Mm. Yeah. I used to think when I was a kid, it would be really funny if I could sing exactly like Whitney Houston. <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, would be really funny. That'd be amazing. You still listen to that, that like iconic Whitney moment in I Will Always Love You, and it still gives me chills. That reminds me of the Cold War. It does. Yeah, it gives me chills like the Cold War. <laughs> Yeah, let's get into our story this week. The motorcycle spy. The spy who rode me. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's that's the motorcycle's memoir. I've been really busy with high-low and stuff. I haven't done as much research as I normally do, which is none. Um, <laughs> this guy's a mouse, right? No, you're thinking, oh. you're thinking of Ratatouille. No, I'm thinking of a mouse Ralph. on a motorcycle. The Matt mouse Ralph. on the motorcycle, the Beverly this, Theory. No, no not Fievel, Joe. There is a mouse on a motorcycle. His name's Ralph, and then at the end of the movie, he drives an ambulance to bring the kid some Advil. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, Fievel would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep it moving. All right. Our main source for this episode is Max Oxley's Stealing Speed, the biggest spy scandal in motorsport history. Today's story starts with humble beginnings, specifically the creation of the two-stroke engine. This type of motor was invented by one Carl Benz in 1878, just two years after Nicholas Otto had significantly improved the four-stroke engine. Uh, if you want to know more about Carl Benz and his first car, check out the episode we talked about Bertha Benz and her big drive in that car. For a little bit of extra context, this moment is right before Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach built the first motorcycle in 1885. These German makers were having a mini engineering renaissance, constantly one-upping each other with innovation. Fast forward to 1919 at a factory in Zschopau, Germany, where steam engineer Jürgen Skaft Rasmussen, originally from Denmark, owned a company named DKW, which stood oh. for Dampfkraftwagen or steam-powered car. DKW later became Audi. Oh. Whoa. Dude, this is like in Walk the Line. <laughs> when they all hung out. Yeah. Hey, it's me, Buddy Holly. Hey, it's me, Buddy Holly. Hey, buddy. Hey, guy. That was a really good set you just did there. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, what's it going on? I was Aaron, Elvis Aaron Presley. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in the thick of all that water vapor, gentlemen, Rasmussen developed a tiny new two-stroke engine, threw it on a bicycle, and called it Dash Kleine Wanda, which <laughs> translates to The Little Wonder. Fun. That was my nickname when I was a child performer. Me too. <laughs> Whoa. No way. <laughs> yeah, you guys are yeah. in different circuits. I heard about you. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> Joe was up north. Yeah, I did the Midwestern circuit. Yeah, I guess our circuits never crossed. Yeah. Yeah. That's huh. weird. I never heard about you before. Whoa. <laughs> That's okay. You sure? Yeah, no, I was pretty like caught up in, you know, performing and uh, yeah. sold out malls. Yeah, but little Kentucky wonder, huh? Nothing. No, it doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> Surprising. It was pretty big. <laughs> I mean, I was little. I was a little wonder. No, yeah, but. I get that. I understand now. I just had never heard that name when I was performing. Hmm. 
That's surprising. Anyway, Das Kleine Wunders, the little wonders, were wildly popular, much like James and Joe, and led to years of growth for DKW. And before the war, the first one, they produced 45,000 bikes a year, making them the biggest motorcycle manufacturer in the world. DKW was also a respected racing team, winning the European Championship four times in the 1930s. Their crown jewel was a 250cc bike that Ewell Klug drove in the 1938 TT trophy races which ripped a record speed for the time of 114 miles per hour oh no that sounds um, terrifying probably <laughs> yeah, the skinniest no. tires in the world <laughs> no, no yeah. suspension terrible roads uh-uh. sheep sheep just like crossing the road <laughs> yeah, so many probably sheep. like a, a newsboy cap for a helmet <laughs> <laughs> So. <laughs> Back then, helmets were purses that they borrowed from their wives, and they just put them on their heads. So it's a, it was a different time. Different time. DKW had become the proven leader in global two-stroke technology. They even had cars and pickup trucks running their engines. But that would dramatically change in the most fateful year of the 20th century, 1939. DKW, along with basically every other engineering and manufacturing firm in Germany, were commanded to change course and fuel the Nazi war effort. DKW was swept up with it. Ernst Degner was still a boy too young for both motorcycle racing and conscription by the Nazis. Not so lucky, though, was a brilliant 20-year-old German engineer named Walter Kaden. Walter Kaden spent his youth obsessing over motorcycles. His childhood fascination with racing was spurred by his father, who loved motors of all kinds and even took his son to the grand opening of the Nürburgring. His dad was also a chauffeur for management at DKW, which helped Volter get an apprenticeship at their (laughs) Chopau, which helped Walter get an apprenticeship at their Chopau factory while he was still in college. As the war intensified, Caden was spared the battlefield. Instead, He'd work on aircraft technology. Beyond the planes he serviced, Caden became particularly interested in rocket weaponry, Uh namely the V program and its inventor, America's sweetheart, Werner von Braun. Born him later. The results of Caden and those he worked with were groundbreaking, but truly horrific. Nazi jets and the V rockets pummeled the Allies, claiming thousands of lives in World War II. It actually could have been a lot worse. The Jets uh, were kind of too late to the war effort, even though they were uh, they, they didn't produce very many of them. And then the V rockets, like the V two, uh, they couldn't really produce enough of them again, thankfully. But they they were able to launch a few of those over to Britain, and uh, it was not good. Oh, yeah, there's a story of one uh, hitting a like a movie theater, and. I don't think that was in Britain, though. But anyway, just a, a truly devastating weapon, uh, you know, killed like 500 people just with one. So, you know, history is thankful that they weren't able to produce more of them. Well said. After World War II ended, the old DKW factory was brought back to life by the Soviets, who now controlled East Germany. The factory was now part of the communist state's auto conglomerate known as IFA. IFA leadership decided that the group should start a racing program to help with promotion. And so began their Grand Prix team, MZ Motorrad. That's super interesting. A a communist racing team. I know, isn't it? We should look into making a whole episode on that. I mean, a lot of the rest of this episode is about that team. All right. Well, wish granted. Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, that's my second wish. (laughs) Oh, man, you spoiled. No, what a waste of it. Dude, Sinbad is like, you fool. (laughs) Dude, that's the problem with genies. They're so tricky. (laughs) You got to be really careful about how you word stuff. Four stroke bikes from the West dominated GP leaderboards during the 50s. But because cash was tight for engineering, MZ had no chance but to develop a two stroke model. The team knew that if they were ever to stand a chance, they would need someone who could maximize their underdog engine's potential. MZ turned to Walter Kaden to help. When the DKW company was swallowed up by West Germany, Kaden had ended up running a woodworking business, of all things. But as the communist regime tightened their grip on individual businesses, he was forced to shut it down. 
So when IFA offered him, uh, so when IFA offered him both race team manager and chief engineer positions, he was eager to sign. He was making wooden motorcycles at this time. Mm-hmm. They didn't. They weren't very fast. <laughs> As the 1950s began, Caden worked on the new two-stroke in the garage in Chopau. He had a singular focus, getting an engine ready for the 1955 World Championship at the West German GP to be held at the Nürburgring. Caden's innovation was to look at the two-stroke less like a pumping chunk of metal, but a vibrant, sonic instrument. He knew that the sound waves in the two-stroke exhaust could act as a power boost like he had learned in the war. So he created his own exhaust to realize the full potential of the pressure waves from the combustion chamber. He took advantage of a rotary valve, which meant the engine's valves didn't have to be strictly timed like a conventional piston-ported two-stroke. What the hell is this thing? I'm having a trouble, like, conceiving it. It sounds like it has a charge pipe, which kind of, it's not, doesn't act like a turbocharger, but like pulls air through the motor, through the exhaust. Very interesting. But this rotary valve concept is gnarly. The first manifestation of Caden's work was a 125cc racer. It weighed 40 pounds less than their four-stroke rivals. And crucially, it delivered more horsepower at the same capacity. When the 55 MZs rolled off the truck at the Nürburgring, spectators, rival teams, and journalists were skeptical to say the least. The 125 look at that small. Look at this small little oh, boy. Look at that small little boy. <laughs> oh, she looks like a little wonder. He wants to hang with the big boys. <sighs> oh, you want to hang with the big boys? <laughs> Maybe you should go get yourself a little strutter, baby boy. <laughs> I see that the town mummy has made strutters and pretzels, little boy. Maybe you should go get yourself a little strutter with some cream. Hope you brought another pair of little hosen, little boy. I because you're going to be poo-pooing in your pants once the race. Your breakfast pretzel, <laughs> you're going to poo-poo in your little hosen. Ah, oh, you're going to pee-pee your breakfast beer all over the front <laughs> of your leather overalls, baby boy. You're coming in my hose and What? That means I just shit my pants in German. <laughs> <laughs> Do you Google it? No, no, there's this, uh, there's this movie called Stalingrad. It's about the siege of Stalingrad, and there's a guy, like, this dude shoots his, like, <laughs> one of his buddies, like a German sh- soldier shoots one of his com- one of his dudes, and then he says that that he shit his pants. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's the only German I know. <laughs> I love throwing that one at Jesse because uh, he uh-huh. knows German, and it yeah. gets him every it gets him every time. <laughs> I can't use it too often though. I gotta, oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. The 125 looked like a hand-me-down compared to the sleek bikes of the West, and it's shrill Ratatat motors. I love Ratatat. Uh, sound was swallowed up by the thunderous droll of the four strokes. In the words of Grand Prix journalist Mick Roulette, we all smiled when we saw the MCs. We were sure they would seize when held flat out on the straight. These old MCs look so, so sick. They're just like it, exactly how you would imagine a communist bike. It's very bare, but it looks so dope. I think this guy is a uh, like more British sounding. His name's Mick Willette, and he's. Wait, what are you doing? Impression. We all smiled when we saw the MZs. We were sure they would seize <laughs> when held flat out on the straights. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little bit of Kentucky in there. Hey, give me back my wallet. <laughs> Small wallet now. Why are you wearing those? Small wallet now. Fingerless I gloves. I fucking hate pikeys. What the hell is it? Is this a Discover card? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from the future. <laughs> oh, that guy just turned into a purse. <laughs> Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Stitch Fix. Shopping for new clothes can be time consuming and stressful. 
So why not let Stitch Fix do all the work so that you can spend more time doing the things you love? It's easy and fun to get started. I did Stitch Fix a few months ago. Let me tell you about the process. First, you take a few minutes to set up your Stitch Fix profile. You answer a few questions about what you like to wear, what you don't, and how open you are to trying new styles. It's a lot of fun. After that, Stitch Fix's expert stylists will go to work, finding items exclusively for you. Every piece is handpicked for you and it's unique to your size, style, and your budget, making it the best way to discover clothes that make you look and feel your best. I got a pair of jeans and they fit perfectly. And I was like, oh my God, I love this. Along with the jeans that I got sent, uh, Stitch Fix sends you five pieces to try on at home. You keep what you love and send back what you don't. Shipping, returns, and exchanges are easy and free. And guess what? I kept every single piece because I like them all so much. Sign up today at stitchfix.com slash gas to get 20 bucks off your first purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash gas to get 20 bucks off your first purchase. This is a limited time offer purchased within two days of sign up. Stitchfix.com. Go try it out. It's fun. Big thanks to Every Plate for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Are you tired of eating the same plate of chicken and rice on repeat? I know I am. Every Plate offers a wide range of mouthwatering meat, seafood, veggie options, and more. Plus, you can swap out proteins, veggies, and sides to your liking. After all, variety is the spice of life. Every Plate's quality ingredients come carefully packed and pre-portioned, preventing you from buying things you end up using once and inevitably shove into the back of your fridge. I do this all the time. It sucks. Every Plate helps you skip the tedious trips to the grocery store and delivers everything you need to cook consistently affordable and delicious meals. Choose from 17 weekly recipes and then, well, sit back. They'll deliver pre-portioned ingredients and easy-to-follow recipe cards right to your front door. I've tried a bunch of these meal service delivery plans and every plate is by far the best i really like how affordable it is you can get every plate for 179 per meal and i'm gonna show you how to do that try every plate for just 179 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code gas 179 get started with every plate for just 179 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code gas 179 The race wasn't a full-on fairy tale. The Italian MV team won the day, but after it was all over, the buzz around the paddock was all about the MZs. The two strokes finished in fifth and sixth, a far better showing than anyone had anticipated, including Mick Willett. <laughs> oh, boy. Boy. <laughs> boy. <laughs> Fuck me, bum. <laughs> <laughs> MZ had the racing world's attention. All they needed now was an elite rider. Enter Ernst Dengner. <laughs> now 24 who Caden had signed before the 1956 season I thought of my name I was just there in like big neon lights <laughs> <laughs> Ernst Dengner Degner had already started turning heads when he beat MZ in the GDR championship aboard a far less powerful Zimmerman bike he was vain but gritty kind of like uh, Jeremiah <laughs> and had relentless ambition to be a champion. He also, also like Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah. He also had a deep understanding of how to maximize the two strokes performance. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> uh, Oxley described Ernst as a natural born engine whisperer, like Zach Job. Wow. Well, we got hitting all the yeah. guys in here. You'd think a little prestige would come with being tapped as an official factory writer, but in the cash-strapped world of East Germany, that was not the case. Degner was required to carry out mundane tasks around the shop and earned a worker's wage. Even the helmet Caden provided Degner was a repainted pre-war model. Well, I mean, it is a East German racing team. It's like the Mighty Ducks, but also kind of bad guys. It's like the Mighty Ducks if Rochester, Minnesota... Uh, was kind of like a post-war hellhole, and they had just a bunch of like rusty scraps lying around. Yeah. And they were communist. And you weren't allowed to leave. Yeah. Before you'd <laughs> yeah. be shot. Despite the lack of funding, Degner found quick success. In the 1957 season of the East German Road Racing Championship, he won all but three races and claimed the title. I mean, it's East German Road Racing Championship. <laughs> <laughs> and by 1959, he also took his first 125cc Grand Prix victory, cementing MZ 
as an undeniable new force within the circuit. Much of the credit for this incredible run was due to Caden's engineering breakthroughs. Along with a new six-speed gearbox, he had managed to push the 125's engine to almost double the output of the 56 model, 16.5 horsepower at 9,200 RPM. Whoa, 92. This thing sounds sick in like a specific way. And while this newly discovered power resulted in faster bikes, we need to acknowledge the true insanity it took for Degner and his pals to actually race one of these things. If you're a fan of the show, you already know that the racers of the 1950s and 60s were extreme characters living on the edge, and a shocking number of them paid the ultimate price in pursuit of speed. Quote, The reality was that one of us died every month during the race season. Remembers Jim Redman, a six-time world champion with Honda during the 1960s. Frank Paris, Degner's teammate, said that the carnage eventually numbed his senses. Quote, There were so many deaths that, to be perfectly honest, you got immune to it. In 62 and 63, there were 14 of us that got killed. You didn't think about it. It was only when you came in at the end of the race And someone said, so-and-so is not with us anymore. That's when it really hits you. Frank Paris kind of sounds like poopies from Jackass. (laughs) I was trying to do more of a berry. Oh, oh, that was a good berry. Mm -hmm. That was really good. That was pretty good. The post-war citizens of Europe were seemingly numbed to death. The riders who failed to come back at the end of races weren't that different from the pilots who had failed to return from battle. Crowds were starved of entertainment in those bleak years of recovery. So despite the relentless loss of life, the races were a welcomed escape from it. For the racers, who dubbed themselves the Continental Circus, the way to stay sane was simple. Ride as fast as possible, and if we survive, bring on the women and booze. In the words of Jim Redman, We realized we could get killed, so we lived it up between meetings and maximized on life. It was like... Fuck it. We've survived another mission. <laughs> Let's live it up a bit. I'm going to say that next time we all get together to party. <laughs> Let's maximize this life. <laughs> <laughs> Degner wouldn't become one of the casualties of that era, but if his medical chart was stocked at Barnes & Noble, it'd be in the horror section. He suffered a brain hemorrhage, severe facial burns, a broken arm, femur, and shattered kneecap along with dozens of other injuries. Ouch. Sounds like a Wednesday night down at the S&M club. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want I want a facial scar, but I don't want to go through the hassle of it. You can get one. You can get them. Really? Yes. Yeah, the guy. Who's, who was it? The guy was it who, Kyle's buddy that does it? Yeah, the guy who put the magnet in Zach's hand will do it. Will do facial Does he just scars. slice you with a blade or something? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Ouch. No. He's a guy who no, puts magnets in hands. <laughs> yeah. His, his, he's got a tongue like a snake. No, he's cool. Yeah, I draw the no, line at cool. snake tongue. I want to do a scar over my eye. <laughs> Just like the most like <laughs> messed up looking YouTuber. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, him to go a little bit too deep and now I can't see out of my eye. I got to get skinnier though. You've never seen like a heavier person with a face scar? I well, haven't. It just doesn't look cool. I got to get like skinny as Jeremiah. Dude, that's impossible. He's uh, six foot five and he's 170. I'm going to get as skinny as Jeremiah by August. It's June right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're just shooting high low in a sweatsuit, <laughs> like one of those plastic bag suits. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be healthy. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to look bad. I'm going to look great. Bad, but yeah. <laughs> <sighs> well, when doctors told Degner he'd be out for a month after a crash in 1960, Degner escaped out of a hospital window so he could prep for a race. This restless individualism would prove to carry over into other parts of Degner's life as he began to rise as a celebrity in East Germany. Restless individualism in East Germany being used in the same sentence is very interesting. As the West rapidly grew in wealth, MZ did everything in their power to keep their star rider happy. The state paid for Degner and his sweetheart, Gerda's wedding, in 1957. (laughs) Then they supplied a large apartment as their family began to grow. That's not very communist of them. No, they would do that. No, it's very communist of them. 
the state's paying for it because they got to no, keep. I know, but, but it's not, you know, like he's getting special treatment. Uh, well, lots of people got special treatment. I think, yeah, um, you know, the VIPs, they get their, their big apartments. I don't think the this oligarchy. is out of the ordinary. Yeah, I don't think this is out of the ordinary. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, like, Stalinist Russia and then what happened after Stalin uh, passed away, like, yeah, there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on in the Soviet Union. Greasing the wheels of the world. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> of their world, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Donut Media, greasing the wheels of the world. <laughs> By 1960, the Degners were hobnobbing with the Soviet elite and considered members of the GDR aristocracy. See? However, nothing in the East could satisfy Degner. His high-class social status didn't change the fact that he was still paid little more than a factory worker. It was embarrassing to see his Western peers speed around in Ferraris and Porsches, not to mention stack piles of cash. Plus, that's pretty. That's a. Uh... That's a pretty nice little perk right there. <laughs> yeah, we like that big stack of cash. <laughs> Plus, he and his wife, Gerda, were becoming disillusioned about raising their children in a communist state. Very soon, he would find a way out. Fittingly, the company that would aid in his escape was on the other side of the world. By the late 1950s, Suzuki was operating the largest two-stroke manufacturing plant in the world other than my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> like Honda before them, the company decided to expand westward and develop a race team. Very fan. This is the beginning of some very big gentlemen. We did, we did an episode on Honda joining the TT. I'm talking about Suzuki right now, Joe. Try and pay attention. Oh, jeez. <laughs> But Suzuki's first two years in the European race world were far from smooth. Not only were their bikes inferior, but even communication with headquarters back in Japan was unreliable and expensive. They also had to deal with cultural differences and racism fueled by post-war resentment. Yeah, man, this is like 10 years after World War II. Yeah, this is barely a blink in the eye of that harsh mistress history. Meanwhile, Degner and MZ were leading the world championship points race for the first time. Caden's 1961-125 was a revelation. It had new front suspension and a stronger frame for better handling, and he'd taken the engine to 25 horsepower and its red line from 10,000 to 10,400 RPM, making it the first naturally aspirated engine in history to theoretically make 200. 100 horsepower per liter and the fastest motorcycle in the world championship. Well wow. said. Suzuki president Shunzo Suzuki knew that his team was potentially years away from achieving the performance of the MZ two strokes. Shunzo called up Suzuki's Western educated fixer, Jimmy Matsumiya. And the two decided to get creative with their efforts by orchestrating the theft of MZ's designs. Whoa. I'm getting the old crew back together for one last job. You know I'm retired, Shunzo. It's to steal MZ's plans. When do we start? <laughs> first, <laughs> they needed an inside man. And the first name that came to mind was Ernst Degner. <laughs> Jimmy had first become acquainted with Degner during the 1960 TT. We made a whole uh, episode about the TT. It's pretty gnarly, pretty fun. You should listen to it. When the two men's teams were staying at the same hotel. Man, I bet that was fun. The German and the <laughs> Japanese man had formed a bond over a mutual love of an American art form and jazz music. Hmm. It's the notes you don't hear. The notes you don't play. Yes. Degner's fondness for jazz was a tell of his undeniable admiration for the West. Because it came from America, listening to jazz in the GDR was a borderline criminal offense. And by borderline, I mean probably a criminal offense. <laughs> <laughs> the government even tried framing East German jazz player Reginald Rudorf as a spy in 1957. Do you know, going back to the most Isley Cantina theme, that yes. style of music in the Star Wars books and script is called jizz? Jizz. Jizz, that's a real thing. Yep, it's a real thing. Uh, George Lucas is a genius. George Lucas is a genius. <laughs> Matsumiya, who was very well aware of Degner's restlessness, agreed to offer the racer the moon. 
Beyond a guaranteed factory rider position, Degner would get 10,000 pounds a season. Wow. Almost 10 times Suzuki's typical salary for their racers. But obviously, Suzuki wasn't just paying Degner for his riding skills. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, 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 no. There's something else, though. No, no. Oh, there's a, we need a little of something else. You know, we need a little uh, cherry on top of this Sunday. <laughs> they were paying for Caden's priceless MZ engine intel to be hand delivered by Degner himself. This is actually happening nowadays with jets. Like, um, I think Japan paid a Russian jet fighter to mm-hmm. defect and fly the plane over to Japan so they can reverse engineer the jet. Whoa. Is it the Sukhoi Felon? No, that's a plane. Yeah, they that's used a jet? it in Top Gun. Oh, that's amazing. I got to see that movie. Dude, not even joking. Best movie I've ever seen. It got 97 on Roddy T's. Dude, I, it's how I imagine people felt when they saw Ben-Hur. <laughs> <laughs> like just the scale of it is, I had no idea. My favorite Sukhoi is the SU-27 Flanker. Not as cool a name as the Felon, but I love the shape of this plane. It's so fucking cool. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. That's the one I'd get. <laughs> the 5.7's tight, too, though. They're a little angled. Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit wider. It's like a Gen 5 stealth aircraft, kind of like our F-22 and F-35. It actually looks a lot like the YF-23 experimental prototype. Oh, that, my God, uh, dude. You guys are chosen. too deep for me. They call it, in the movie, they call it the Gen 5 fighter. Last year when we were shooting bumper to bumper out at Las Vegas Motor Speedway, it's like right next to the that Air Force base. And they were doing like a lot of flyovers. And this pair of F-22s flew over the track. Super loud, by the way. Yeah. And then... They both pulled up and just went straight up. Yeah. So fast. It's so sick. I'd never seen anything like it. They look gray in pictures, but it's more, it has like this like gold kind of reflective Whoa. effect. It was incredible. I was at the net, not to go too far off into planes, but I was at the NASCAR championship a couple years ago when Joey Logano won. And uh, I was like standing by the podium and the two pilots that did the flyover like in these, like, I think F-18s or something, they were standing next to me. And, like, Joey was getting his trophy, like, for winning, like, the NASCAR mm-hmm. championship. You know, like, you, this guy, like, you work your whole life and never get this, but, like, this guy was getting it. And one of the pilots leaned over to the other one, and he goes, he didn't fly a fighter jet today. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take your victories. Dude, and I was like, huh, well, yeah. I mean, what you did is cooler. <laughs> yeah. There's not a single thing on this planet yet that is cooler than flying a fighter jet. <laughs> I guess raising a, a son, like a strong child, and then right under that is flying a fighter jet. <laughs> Where's making like a realistic looking cake, like a cake that looks like something else? Strong seven. <laughs> Whoa, still top 10 though. Okay. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure, man. If you can make a cake that looks like a circular saw and I can't tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, if I if I brought a cake that looked like a circular saw to the office and I was like, oh, what's this? I pretended like I was going to saw my fingers, but then it just turned into cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then my hand was also cake. By now, you've probably heard all about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. You might already even be investing in them. But did you know that you could invest in cryptocurrencies through your retirement account? That's right. With iTrust Capital, you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies from a crypto IRA and get all the same tax advantages as a traditional IRA. iTrust Capital allows you to invest in over two dozen of the most popular cryptocurrencies. And unlike the stock market, you can buy and sell 24 hours a day. The iTrust Capital platform is easy to use and it only takes a few minutes to create your account. Setting up an IRA is free and iTrust fees are low. It's time to start taking control of your financial future. With iTrust Capital, you can get all the tax benefits of a retirement account while investing in crypto. If you're interested in cryptocurrencies or retirement accounts or both of them, I would check out iTrust Capital. Visit itrustcapital.com to start investing today. That's itrustcapital.com. Taxes and conditions may apply. Fees apply. Cryptocurrencies are speculative investment with risk of loss. iTrust Capital Inc. does not provide legal investment or tax advice. Consult with a qualified legal investment or tax professional.
Hey, another thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline Motor Oil Brand. You already know that Valvoline is the number one motor oil brand, but did you know that they're the number one gear oil brand too? That's right. If you've got to put some gear oil in your differential or your transmission, you got to reach for Valvoline's new Flex Fill Gear Oil. This Flex Fill packaging is a flexible pouch that is easy to fit in tight spaces and produces less waste. We just uh, had to put some gear oil in low car's transmission, and this is the oil we use. Very easy to fit underneath your car. This big old squeezable pouch allows for less waste and easier application. Fits in tight spaces, like I've mentioned. It comes in two full synthetic grades, 75 weight 90 and 75 weight 140. Available for exceptional high and low temperature protection. It has an extreme pressure additive for better load carrying capacity and wear protection. And it has an anti-foaming agent that quickly breaks down foam for better lubrication. So if you got to do some maintenance in your drivetrain, go get yourself some Flex Fill from Valvoline. Valvoline, thank you very much for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Degner's escape to West Germany in 1961 played out like a Bond movie. On the same weekend he was racing in the Swedish Grand Prix, he arranged for a friend to loan him his bulky American car, perfect for smuggling an entire family in its trunk. So they let him leave East Germany to race and go to Sweden, right? Yeah, so this is interesting. Like, I'm trying to think this whole time. I was like, okay, if you're, like a, if you're a, a, a communist bureaucrat looking over a racing team, you know you don't want your athlete to leave. So, like, you obviously can't let his family leave with him. Yeah. During any of these racing weekends, because then they're going to escape. There's a big risk of them escaping. Mm -hmm. So it must have been kind of like a, a last minute kind of deal. Yeah. To have approval for his family to go. Otherwise, no, look, like, we're just going to go to Sweden. I'm going to have a couple able skivers. I'm going to do a little <laughs> skiing and then I'll be back. My family's not coming. They were probably driving a, uh, some sort of Mopar because those trunks in the 60s were enormous. After the race which some believe Degner intentionally lost. Degner secretly left the track with a suitcase full of blueprints, drawings, and engineering notes on MZ's two-stroke technology and drove into Denmark. From there, he caught a ferry to West Germany and then drove to the French border to finally reunite with his family. Incredibly, after completing his harrowing journey, Degner was still determined to finish out the racing season. <laughs> he was in the hunt for the 125 championship, but his new bike from Suzuki was delayed during shipping, and he ended up missing the final race. After the 61 season, Suzuki quickly sent Degner to Japan to develop their 1962 Grand Prix engine. Using what he learned from Caden, Degner helped design not only a new 125cc racer, but also a 50cc version, both relative replicas of the 61MZ design. Caden would later discover that even the specialized tools he made had been copied by Suzuki Manufacturing. As the new season began, less than a year after his defection, Degner returned to the Grand Prix circuit aboard his new Suzuki and was immediately successful, winning that year's inaugural 50cc world title. That's tiny! That's a pit bike championship. <laughs> Basically. His new New Zealander teammate, Hugh Anderson, very New Zealand name, won both the 50 <laughs> and 125 titles the following year and would go on to claim the 50cc title again in 1964 and the 125 crown in 1965. However, during this tremendous wave of Suzuki success, Degner's life would be forever altered at the Japanese Grand Prix in November of 1963 when he crashed his 250 on the first lap of the famous Suzuka circuit. He was rescued from a ball of fire, needed over 50 skin grafts, and was unable to return to racing until the next September. Impressively, upon Degner's return, he won the 125cc Japanese Grand Prix and three more races in 1965 before retiring at the end of the 1966 that, season. That's incredible Yeah, that he has, like, because normally when racers crash and come back, they're a little bit scared and yeah. tentative. He's like the Nicky Lauda of tiny bike racing. Yeah, this dude just sends it. <laughs> Meanwhile, Suzuki, who began the decade in the GP cellar, ended the 60s with 15 world championships, bringing a two-stroke revolution to the sport. Within a little more than a decade, four strokes were tossed by the wayside in Grand Prix racing, which is pretty interesting. I didn't know that. Nowadays, it's all four-stroke stuff. For a long time, it was all two strokes, right? It's two stroke, Yeah, and then the four strokes were bigger and beefier and just better, and then these uh -huh. guys come in and just like... 
take it. It's like it's like it comes goes back and forth. Same thing in motocross well, too. Well, you know, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, like within our lifetime. Yeah. Like what? Like I know as like GP. Like I, there's a time when it switched re- relatively recently from two to four in motocross for sure. I think that in on, on like road road racing, it's it's been four stroke for a good long time now. Degner's betrayal rocked Caden. The MZ team completely fell apart. They never again touched the success that Degner achieved, and their brainiac engineer seemed to take it the hardest. Friend and former mechanic Ferry Brower said, One thing that Volta always emphasized to me was that was absolutely devastated by Degner's defection. He said, Ernst left me at the time MZ could have won a world championship. He left me alone. I had given all of my trust to him as a person and as a technician, and he betrayed me. That is the toughest thing that happened in my life. It wasn't when I developed a missile that (laughs) killed people. That was pretty hard, but this hit me harder. Even through the years of MZ's success, Caden wasn't heralded in any real way. The glitz and glamour all went to Degen because the government wanted people to think that the bikes were powered by communist teamwork. The GDR did give Caden the Patriotic Medal of Merit in 1965, but it was small potatoes compared to what he believed could have been possible if Degner had stayed and his technology not compromised. Caden lived in obscurity for the last few decades of his life, and he died of cancer in March of 1996. Wow. Um. What does living in obscurity mean? Because sometimes I think it would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, say you have a cabin mm-hmm. and a really good dog. And you get up every morning, you chop wood, you hang out with your dog. Is that obscurity? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I think you have to be involved in something kind of public. And then... Like a YouTube channel. Then move away from the public eye. Like a YouTube channel. Obscured. Okay. So like say you had a YouTube channel. Yes. And then you move to the woods next to a nice lake. This is really specific. And then you live like Nick Cage and Pig. Um, Yeah. Because he was a famous chef in that. And uh he had the spotlight for a while. And then he Mm -hmm. didn't want to be in. He wanted to be obscured from the public eye. Yeah. I'm going to live in obscurity one day. Cool. Sounds well, let, me, let us know uh, your address whenever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You can come by. Let us know the GPS coordinates because I know that they won't have an address. So. Yeah, yeah, I'll we'll, drop a pin. We'll like make a video out of it. Yeah, put yeah. It on the channel. For yeah. sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Finding my long lost boss? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're roommates with Rivers Cuomo and you guys are making an album? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it's going to have Hurley from Lost on the cover. (laughs) Degner, meanwhile, would meet his end much sooner than Caden. Degner was a changed man after his fiery crash in 63. Quote, he lost his glow, sense of humor, everything, said teammate Jim Redman. Even when he returned to the track, people close to him say a dark depression had washed over him. Degner's personal relationships also began to deteriorate. Many friends said he pushed them out or cut them off. Degner even fell out with Paul Petrie, the friend who had risked his freedom by helping smuggle Degner's family to the West. Ah, so I guess that answers that question, how they got to West Germany. As time went on, Degner's reliance on morphine and other medications took an extreme mental and physical toll. His family says he began to experience delusions and paranoia. When he died in 1983, at the age of only 51, rumors quickly circulated that he had committed suicide or may have even been murdered by the East German Stasi after a decades-long quest for revenge. But the most believable version of events is that he died of heart failure from ill health. We can feel for Degner's plight, but it's hard to arouse much sympathy for Caden in all of this, given his status as an ex-Nazi engineer. We mentioned Werner von Braun earlier. According to writer Max Oxley's book, Stealing Speed, The Biggest Spy Scandal in Motorsports History, Caden had an opportunity to join the celebrity scientist stateside after the war, but declined. Probably part of Operation Paperclip. 100%. Werner von Braun was a Nazi war criminal, and we put him on TV. Yes. Caden's life could have easily taken a very different path. 
Both men reflect how complicated life was for Germans during and after World War II. Complicated is a good descriptor uh-huh. of that stuff. But I don't want to be sympathetic. It, that's like, it's also an easy way to say, saying, oh, it's complicated is a very mm-hmm. easy way to excuse things. And I'm not mm-hmm. excusing it. You yeah. know, a lot of these guys uh, were, were spared. They were spared the hangman's noose by uh, things like Operation Paperclip or as we just read in this episode, the Soviets did the same thing. They had their own program saving these Nazi well, scientists. Well, we like fought over them. We, yeah, we did. The USSR and, and the United States fought over the Nazis. They scientists. were like chases and races to get to these scientists first before the other side got to them. And, you know, these guys, they, they get a new job in a new country, in a new territory, under new leadership, and try their best to forget what they did in the past uh, maybe try to make peace with it in some way, but it's not excusing it. But at least when it comes to Ernst Degner, his legacy is that he th- took things into his own hands. You know what my favorite Ernest movie is? Ernst jumps over the Iron Curtain. Mine is uh, Ernest Scared Stupid. <laughs> That's a really good one with the, the tree and the... Yeah. Isn't and there they, leprechauns in it or something? It's like little trolls and then the, yeah. they don't like milk, so they feel super circus full of milk. Oh, yeah. All right, we've got some listener mail. Uh, James, do you want to hit that? Hey, guys. I just want to start off by saying how much I love this show and all the other media donut media makes. You guys brighten up my Monday every week. I wanted to chime in on what the Yugo's equivalent today would be. I think at around $14,500, the Mitsubishi Mirage is pretty close. It's cheap and kind of cheaply made car that gets good mileage, and that's about it. Thanks for all the great stuff, you guys. I can't wait for the next high-low. Steven, Space Coast, Space Coast, Coast baby. Space Coast, Space Coast, Coast, Coast to Coast. Thanks, Steven. Shouts to that Space is Coast. a pretty good, pretty analogous car, I guess. I drove one on a racetrack. Yeah. When? Fast car, slow oh. driver. Oh, yeah. How was it? <laughs> uh, terrible. <laughs> it's a three-cylinder. It, it was the worst car that I could wear. <laughs> well, uh, Stephen, you'll be happy to know that by the time this airs, I think the first uh, video in a s- three-part series, uh, we're putting V8s in the 350Zs. And yeah, we're right. We're currently in the throes of it. We've started both of our motors. I cut a hole in the bottom of high car on accident. <laughs> we're putting on angle kits. Uh, Nolan's car. Is it on the ground right now? Not yet. No. Almost on the ground. Should be on the ground Monday. Uh, hopefully uh, mine will be too. Cause we've got to go to the dyno Tuesday. And then uh, in six days from when we're recording this, we're going to drag race them. Um, and yeah. When's the alignment guy coming? I don't know, man. We'll talk about it offline. We definitely have to get a photo of both of you guys in front of your cars with your arms crossed. Oh, yeah. Thumbnail. For sure. For sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> classic that's drag race photo. <laughs> <laughs> Hit us up at pascasadonimedia.com. We'd love to hear from you. Hey. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this episode. This was a really fun one. I don't know about fun. It was a really interesting one. Fun. Great, great story. Um, mm-hmm. I'm gonna I have that fun. Book. I'm going to check the out that book. Fun. Um, follow the boys at Joji Weber, at James Pumphrey. Yeah. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Subscribe gonna, to the podcast. Tell your friends about it. Leave check. us a review. That's how these things work. That's right. Um, Stay in touch. Also support our sponsors. Uh, and uh, if you want to make a podcast, just go ahead and make one. It's pretty easy. All you need is like a <laughs> microphone and a computer. Why is this? Why is this your sign off now? Because it's my. I want to encourage people <laughs> to do things. Okay. I don't want to just say, "Hey, take care" or "Be kind" or "I love you." I want to encourage our audience to make things. Oh, that, that's great. I just wanted to clarify. Cool. I'm on a real Casey Neistat kick these days. You're a Casey Nice dad. Well, he's an, he's nicer than me and a dad. Oh, fuck. Okay. <laughs> right, bye, guys. Goodbye.